Hi folks, Tris here. Thanks for listening to Modem Prometheus, and thanks especially to all of you who have joined our Patreon. We don't run ads, so the whole podcast is supported by you. If you'd like to help out, head over to patreon.com forward slash modem prometheus. Members get behind the scenes notes, early access, bonus episodes, and a lot more exciting stuff. Today's story is called Mobius, and is about time and water, and how the two are half twisted together. Mills, Jemima Millicent Lockwood, named by parents a little too in love with 1932, has become pretty good at not thinking about the boy she killed. She isn't thinking about him right now. She has never been back to the canal. Recently, whole weeks have gone past when the image of him out cold on the cabin floor hasn't suddenly flashed into her mind when she's been adjusting the headline layout on the magazine or in the middle of a meeting about circulation. It was, it must be said, a long time ago. Ten years. To the day. Rob was his name. Not that Mills remembers. Not that she still dreams about that night sometimes. About the creaking wood and the narrow corridor that was far too long. About the woman with the scars like a whole handful of switchblades had raked over one side of her face. She's especially not thinking about him today. Not thinking about him, or the necklace he gave her with the five little elephants connected trunk to tail, the one she wears. Instead, she is cooking. Mushrooms, peppers, radish, ginger, noodles. Her job is at the stage where she's just starting to feel like she's earning more than survival money. But an early stage media career has taught her to be good with spices and creative with the reduced to clear section. She fries and she flavours, and she empties the contents of the wok into a bowl before firing up Netflix. She is halfway through her food when there's a knock at the door. This is fine. She's not expecting anyone. Why would she be expecting anyone? There's nothing special about tonight. It's an entirely usual night with absolutely no significance. But occasionally someone will come round with a package or maybe a neighbour or a friend and this is the kind of thing that might happen on a normal night. Despite this, she doesn't answer the door. It bangs again. And again. Mills puts her plate down, rattling it on the table. She briefly considers getting a knife from the kitchen but doesn't because that's not how you answer an entirely normal person calling for entirely normal reasons. Then she opens the door. Hey Mills, says Rob. You will require some context for this. Let me go back ten years, and let me take you to the canal. The city has many canals, built hundreds of years ago. Capillaries and veins, excavatory surgery to keep the lifeblood flowing more efficiently from the city's beating heart. Barges of coal and copper and iron no longer ply these routes, trains and lorries taking the cargo instead. But the canals remain. Where once they meant progress, now they are a refuge, taking in everyone for whom the city's heart is now beating too expensively or too fast. Across the canal is a bridge, and on the bridge are a boy and a girl, at the kind of age where you start to be unsure about calling them boy and girl anymore. This is Robin Mills. They are neighbours, and were born on the same minute of the same day, at two different hospitals which are the exact same distance from the transmitter mast on the ridge. They are, as they insist to everyone, just friends. It's not that Mills hasn't noticed Rob's broadening shoulders, or Rob hasn't noticed Mills' growing curves. But they're too much like twins to think of each other that way. Even all four parents say it's as if they're one person. Rob and Mills are not canal folk, but they live close enough to be familiar with the graffiti, to know the pass-along stories. Every culture in the city has its stories. The workers in the skyscrapers talk in hushed tones of the penthouse, to which people go and never return. The taxi drivers have the lady in the back, 
the last fare you know you shouldn't take that will lose you and your car in the streets that don't exist. And the folk of the canal have the drifting swan, the impossible boat that appears just once every ten years. It appears, stays for a few days, then leaves, passing under a bridge and never coming out again. If she moors next to you, they say, then bar your windows, lock your doors, and don't react when something scratches on your roof at night. Robin Mills have been waiting. Tonight is the night. Rob touches Mills' arm, points. There! The swan is moored between two other boats, which seem to be shrinking away from it, crowding their neighbours on the other side. Its cabin is painted the colour of fairy gold, and a line of sucker marks the size of manhole covers runs diagonally up one side. The windows are barred with cold iron shutters. Rob and Mills go down for a closer look. Ten years later, Rob and Mills are together again. They sit in the crown and anchor, and Precious watches them from behind the bar. He knows a story brewing when it sits at one of his tables. So, come on, Rob says. What are you wondering about most? Why you're not furious with me, Mills thinks. But before she can say anything, Rob points to his face. Probably this, right? He's older than he should be. There's no denying that. Mills is 25. Rob's hair now has more salt than pepper. His copper blue eyes have faded pale. His skin is starting to show wrinkles. It's still Rob. There's no mistaking the smile or the crooked front tooth. But he's seen more years come and go than Mills has. I don't entirely get it he says. Time moves differently when you're on the water anyway, when you're in the back roads as well. You have 20 years pass instead of 10. Rob shrugs. Didn't seem like 20 when it was happening. You used to be into science. Did you ever study relativity? No, I kind of gave that up. I did media and design. Damn. I was hoping you might have an explanation. As he talks, he fingers the metal band around his neck, simple and silver with a half twist at the front. It is the only jewellery he wears. The rest of his clothes are a mix of coarse fabric and leather. In the city, of course, no one bats an eye. He tells her of the waterways and the back roads, of radio waves that blew past like wind, of markets and avenues and galleries that could only be seen from the corner of your eye. I saw the wild hunt once. The old hunt, with all the lords and ladies in armour, riding horses and cats and snakes and stuff. They just charged out of one of the side roads and leapt right over the canal. The colours, man. It was an incredible sight. What were they chasing? Actually, I think they were being chased. They're country things, really. They don't understand the city. The back roads has its own hunters. The mopeds. You don't mess with them. And you didn't leave? boat's got to have a driver. Rob starts talking about shoals of fish that glittered around the narrowboat at night. Tiny, darting constellations in colours he couldn't describe. How it was like he could reach down and scoop them up to have a handful of stars. Mills wants to say it sounds beautiful, but saying anything positive about Rob's experience feels like falling into a trap. Instead, she nods and makes encouraging noises letting him talk about his life on the water. The only time she speaks is to offer him another drink, to which he says, Still reading my mind after all this time? Mills goes to the bar, and Precious takes her order of another pint and another double gin. That's a face I've not seen in a while, he says, nodding toward Rob. Not for a long while. He's... he's been out of town, Mills says and breaks into nervous giggling. Mm. Precious raises an eyebrow, and Mills is forced to wonder how she hasn't noticed this beautiful man before. You okay? What? Yes, I'm fine. He's fine. He's an old friend. I don't doubt. Precious finishes the pour, and Mills hands over her card. 
when that stops being true, you know who to call. And he gestures to a small pile of business cards on the counter that read Modem Prometheus. Mills cannot, in all honesty, be indignant. She can't believe Rob's forgotten what happened ten years ago. It doesn't matter, anyway. Precious has gone to serve the great planet of a man with the walrus whiskers sat at the bar, giving him what looks like his 15th pint of Hunter's Best. Got to say, says Rob, when she gets back, there's a lot of amazing things in the back roads, but the beer isn't anywhere near as good. What's it like? Watery. Very watery. Well, it's water. They don't drink beer there. How did you manage? It's an attempt at a joke, but Rob takes it seriously. Wasn't easy, at first. But you learn. It's like you just adapt to the place. At the start, everything is strange and confusing and frightening, but you get used to it. Then eventually, this place is the one that seems odd. But hey, what about you? How long's it been? Ten years. Mills murmurs. Right, yeah. Ten years. So, what have you been doing with yourself? And so Mills swallows more gin than is sensible in a single mouthful, and talks about her exams and university and her job at the magazine. And all the while she's thinking, why don't you remember? Why don't you remember? How can you not remember what I did? Ten years ago. Robin Mills creep across the canal embankment. The only lights here are the little lanterns that some other narrowboats have hooked to their cabins, and they don't shine much further than where the deck nudges the concrete. Most of these boats are familiar to them. Permanent moorings. One. The one that looks like a patchwork of different boats and eras and materials is not. They creep closer. The cabin door of the drifting swan opens. Rob grips Mill's arm, pulls her to the shadows at the embankment's edge. A darker shape comes out of the cabin, a thin figure with ragged silver hair almost down to her waist, a metal band with a half twist around her throat, and a long green coat that looks like a cross between a duster and a kimono. Silver tracings like a circuit board are embroidered up one side. The figure stalks off the boat and away down the embankment, never once looking in their direction. She doesn't close the cabin door behind her and it leans invitingly open. Mills looks at Rob with excitement. Rob has experience with this expression. No, he says. No, I'm not going in there. Oh, don't be a pussy. You wanted to check it out, didn't you? It's right there. And with that, she's off the embankment, onto the boat and inside. Rob, after a fateful moment of indecision, follows her in. Neither of them have been on a narrow boat before, but they don't need experience to understand this is strange. The cabin is larger than it should be, and sound moves differently, the city suddenly seeming muted distant. On the wall, a set of tap shoes is mounted like a hunting trophy. They do a brief jig as Mills walks past. She screams, then breaks into giggles. Look at this stuff! The cabin is stacked with curiosities. A faded sketch shows the canal in a twisted loop, like an ancient map. A fat, brightly coloured pitcher covered with a motif of mopeds holds a substance that looks like tar but smells like honey. Mills tries to take a handful of diamonds from an ashtray. They turn to water and fall through her fingers, crystallising again as they drop. Don't like this, Rob mutters. Mills ignores him and moves into the corridor that runs to the aft. The boat creaks invitingly. The cabin door slams open, and the thin woman with silver hair is standing in the doorway. Three parallel scars run down the right side of her face from eye to chin, and she raises a sharp-nailed hand and hisses something that might be language, might be static. 
Mills runs for the aft door. The corridor stretches out ahead of her, lengthening faster than she runs. She's just starting to panic before it snaps back toward her like a rubber band, almost catapulting her into the steering deck. She looks back. Rob isn't following. She scrambles up to the roof and pounds across it. On the outside, the drifting swan has the same proportions any sane narrowboat does. She jumps down onto the foredeck. Through the cabin door, she can see the woman standing over Rob, who is out cold on the floor. She can't see blood, doesn't know what happened. She looks at the door. I'll get help, she says. I'll get help. She jumps off the boat and runs for the street. Before she reaches the top of the embankment, the drifting swan's engine has powered up and it's pulling away into the river. It putters out under the bridge. Mills waits for it to appear again. She waits. Almost until morning. Ten years on, they are back on the bridge. They've got some tinnies and a bottle of gin, which Rob paid for with a credit card the colour of pale gold. The money will have vanished from the shopkeeper's account by the morning. They look out over the dark canal. The swan is moored exactly where it had been a decade ago. I do remember it, you know, Rob says. What happened that night? I remember all of it. Sorry, Mel says, barely more than a whisper. She's wondering if she's about to be pushed in, wondering if she'll let him. I'm so sorry. Look, Rob says, I get it, okay? And I want you to know we're okay. We're good. Mills looks at him, disbelieving. Rob shrugs. I mean, I don't mind admitting I was mad at first. I hated you for a bit. But... I'm older now, and... He sighs. Honestly? If it had been the other way around? I would have done the exact same thing. I can't blame you for being scared, Mills. And I did, for a while. But I shouldn't have done. It wasn't fair. I shouldn't have run away. Nah, you shouldn't. But you were a kid. And you were scared, and I would have run too. And honestly, it's not been a bad life. There's some amazing stuff out there, and I've seen things you wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion? (laughs) You know, I saw that film when it came out. 1982. Mills narrows her eyes at him. She is as old as Rob to the day, and she was definitely not around in 1982. Rob fingers the neckband again, absentmindedly and nods towards the boat. Like I said, time moves differently when you're on the water. Different speed, different directions. I can only come back to this bit of canal once every ten years, but there's lots of bits of canal. A lot of different ten-year cycles. I've been in this place in 1982, 1847, 1961. I've even seen this same boat coming on the other way. I don't understand. Me either, but the boat seems to know what it's doing. You uh, want to see it? Properly this time. Mills fingers the card Precious gave her and glances at the drifting swan. Huge and dark, a sleeping anglerfish. She can't say no. She owes Rob that much. Rob himself is already heading down the steps of the bridge and she follows behind like a balloon on a string. The cabin is different to how she remembers. Less grimy, less stuffed with junk. The tap shoes are not on the wall, the space empty. The whole thing feels warmer, cosy wood panelling instead of hard steel. The jug of honey tar is still there, though. Rob fetches two mugs from a cupboard and pours her a thick drink. They don't have beer, but they have this stuff. Take it slow, it's stronger than it tastes. Despite that, he gulps from his mug, knocking the liquid back like it's fruit juice. Mills sips. It's not as sweet as she expected. A taste like flowers and moonlight. The boat creaks gently beneath her. There's an undercurrent to the sound, almost like it's whispering. On the table is a sketch of the canal, drawn in a loop with a half-twist. One side of the loop shows the back roads, the other side the city, 
and as Mills follows it with her eyes, she finds one side drifting into the other and back again. I remember this, she says. It's kind of a map, Rob says. I've been drawing it. It's how I think the canal works. One side and then the other. Like a Mobius strip. Everything in cycles. You drew a new one? It's the same one. I'm confused. Wait until you see this. Rob fetches a box from one of the top shelves, puts it down in front of her. This is what's left of the stuff that belonged to the last driver. Have a look. What happened to her? Mills asks. Don't know. Hope I'll find out one day. Mills looks through the box. Her head is heavy. Rob wasn't wrong about the honey tar. She blinks, trying to clear it, trying to focus on the bric-a-brac, but all she can see is her necklace. Five elephants trunk to tail, which must have fallen inside, and somehow worked its way to the bottom. She picks it up, head swaying. It's tarnished, the clasp broken. She puts a hand to her throat. Her own necklace is still there. She sways, feels herself fall, feels the necklace she's wearing snap. Sorry, Mills, Rob says. Mills just has time to register that he looks genuinely upset before she blacks out. It's still dark when she wakes up. She's outside. She can hear the city around her. Her hand is on the tiller and she can't take it off. Rob is sat down with her. The bottle of gin he bought is half empty. His shirt is off and in the pale yellow streetlight she can see his torso is a patchwork of scars. One goes right around his left arm, just below the elbow. You're awake, Rob says, slurring the words together. Good. I shouldn't be here. It doesn't want me here anymore, but I just... I just... Mills wants to shout, scream, beg him for help. She can't. Her body is not her own. In exchange, she can feel the lap of water against her hull, the slick of oil in her pipes. It'll let you go once it's finished bonding. Walk around the boat, sleep in the hammock, even get off sometimes. Not for long. You'll need to come back. A few hours here and there. He isn't wearing the neckband anymore. Without looking, Mills knows where it is. She can feel the gentle weight. Look, this isn't... Rob looks at the gin bottle, decides against it. This isn't revenge, alright? I meant what I said. I get it. I don't blame you for running. I didn't want it to be you. But you were the only one it'd take. It had to be you. It had to be you. God, I'm so sorry. Something is walking its way up Mill's spine. It's not there, she knows it's not there, but she can feel it, all the same. Rob is twitching, clearly uncomfortable being on the deck. I don't think it wants me to tell you this, but I'm gonna. You should know. I didn't know, you should. Boat needs a driver. Someone's got to fill the pumps, work the tiller. You fix it when it breaks. It fixes you when you break. It fixes you, but it won't protect you. He holds up his left arm. The fish. I told you about the fish. I tried to touch them. Touch the stars. They stripped my arm to the bone. Boat fixed it. Grew back. Felt every hour of it. Mills feels something at the back of her neck. It flows around the neckband, 
rolls around the twist and slides inside. No stabbing, no ripping. It's just there, anchored by the silver. She can feel it resting gently around the inside of her throat, not hurting, but present, ready at any moment to tighten like a noose, like a choke chain. She finds she can let go of the tiller. It's done, Rob says, seeing her arm move. I should go. Keep the gin. You'll need it. And stay on the boat if you hear mopeds. Mills can feel the boat preparing to leave. She gasps as fuel rushes into the engine. Rob pulls himself unsteadily onto the boat roof to climb back to the embankment. Wait! Mills says. Rob turns. She wants to ask him to stay, but she knows he can't. The swan is in her head, and she knows a lot of things she would rather not. How long were you driving the boat? She asks. I don't know. Time's all over the place. I guess 20, 25 years. Time moves differently on the water, right? It didn't feel like that long. Rob shakes his head. Yeah, time moves different. It felt like 500. Sorry, Mills. Maybe I'll see you around. You'll see me. Eventually. And he leaves, staggering up the steps to the bridge without looking back. The drifting swan chugs backwards into the middle of the canal, pivoting slowly as it moves. Mills feels the tug on the back of her neck, the boat gently tightening its hold on her throat. Not to her, not yet. Just a reminder that it's there. Mills grasps the tiller and urges it on. She should maybe be thinking about her life, her job, all the things she will leave behind. Instead, she is thinking about time and Mobius strips and one thing becoming another over and over again. The boat slips under the bridge and does not come out the other side. Modem Prometheus is written by Neil Merton, performed by Kate Angier and with music and production by me, Tris Oten. Check out my other show at lostterminal.com. It's got more science and less dread. If you like what we do, check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash modemprometheus. If you're not ready for that kind of commitment, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. We'll have another story for you on the next full moon. It'll be along in about a month, unless you're on the water. If you are on the water, well, we wouldn't like to speculate. <laughs>